Welcome back to A People's Guide to Publishing. I'm Joe Beal, the founder and CEO of Microcosm Publishing and Distribution. I'm also the author of A People's Guide to Publishing, which distills what I've learned from selling millions of books over the past 25 years. I'm Ellie Blue. I'm the Editorial and Marketing Director here at Microcosm. We are an independent midlist publisher based in Portland, Oregon and Cleveland, Ohio. We have over 700 books, over 25 employees, and we make about 40 new books every year. And we distribute thousands of titles from other publishers. We started this podcast so that we can share what we've learned with newer publishers so that you can learn from our mistakes. Or maybe you just want to understand the publishing industry. This week, we are here to tell you that fiction is entirely comprised of lies. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> to discuss the ramifications of the Department of Justice telling Penguin Random House that they do not want them buying Simon & Schuster. <sighs> this news fills us all with a moment mm. of zen. Briefly, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. Just breathe in and feel like not all corporate takeovers are inevitable. I know. For now but the real you know i mean i feel like the real takeaways of this you know the number one question i get is like well what does it mean one way or the other mm -hmm. you know because obviously it's like sounds very compelling and commanding but you know in reality is it like what does it actually matter mm -hmm. you know and i felt like even the new york times was kind of reaching when they were trying to demonstrate how bad it was. Well, how bad is it? It's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's nebulous. It's like, if you're a middle or a high tier author, you're gonna get paid less. That's basically what it would mean if Penguin Random House was able to buy Simon & Schuster. Oh, because there would be less competition between major houses? Yeah, the biggest thing, so, you know, the biggest change when Random House merged with Penguin was that, you know, they would often have been in competition for the same book. And, you know, they're not, you know, new at this. So they have interdepartmental policies where if a book is on auction and they own both imprints or divisions, they're not going to you know, fight each other in an auction right, for it. Right, they're not going to ramp up the price. <laughs> you know, it's just like, like because, right. you know, as um, one agent put it, my job is to make sure that my author's advances never earn out, meaning that the author gets paid more than the book was worth is the goal. And, you know, this is sort of the other agent. end of that of... You know, their statement is essentially, my goal is that the author never gets paid what they're worth. You know, and so it's, you know, you have that on one side. You have that on, I don't know, there's a couple different ways of processing it. But, you know, for the most part, it's just any kind of monopoly is bad for, you know, just like resource consolidation, you know, like a typical thing we're seeing right now is that you know penguin random house has really good relationships and really good software management resource management for how they move books how they reprint books you know just levels of daily reporting mm -hmm. that they have access to and you know honestly that was cited as the biggest reason that they were an appealing new owner for simon and schuster who big as they are, multi-billion dollar company every year, doesn't have that level of, you know... Infrastructure? Management, yeah, I would say, well, so, I would say software management, but... Okay. Infrastructure, yes, also correct. What do you think? Um, I mean, so you told me something that really shocked me, because oh. this was not what I expected or knew about the relative size of these two companies. Mm-hmm. Yes. But I might need you to tell me again, because I remember that I was shocked, and I don't remember the exact numbers. So, and this is kind of the funnier part, is that, you know, when you look at the U.S., you know, just looking at the U.S. book market, because, 
it gets really dicey when you try to look at it globally because you know you get into things like currency conversion and you know like Macmillan is really strong in India but not nearly as strong in the United States etc so we're just gonna look at the United States and looking at it that way you know Penguin Random House is arguably about 27% of the US book market mm -hmm. But, you know, from the way that people talk about it, you'd think they were 75%, you mm, know. Mm -hmm. And 27% is pretty big. Yeah. But, you know, as one of the five, well, as the largest of the five largest publishing companies in the U.S., you know, that's not that big, you know. And what about Simon & Schuster? They are single-digit percentage okay. of the u.s book market okay so they're yeah. much much smaller yeah i mean and you know still Even though they're huge yeah yeah and this is sort of the and you know there's lots of way you know the funnier part was that the new york times put it in the way that like the majority of hardcover bestsellers are from one of these two companies and you're like well yeah but <laughs> that's because it's like that's a part of the industry that's really easy to control and but it doesn't actually represent like whole size of market you know but of course they're going to specialize and be good at having a 30 dollar book that they can you know turn into a bestseller um so what does this mean for like independent bookstores and smaller publishers that the sale is maybe not going to go through mm, business as usual mm -hmm. which is not to say great but not <laughs> as terrible but the you know i would be much more interested in how the workman sale shakes out and impacts things because you know honestly it concerns me more to think of workmen becoming you know just blandified by mm. being part of a bigger company i guess and, we'll see in upcoming seasons you know and like simon and schuster if you've been following has mostly been in the news this past couple years for trying to sign these weird alt-right books <laughs> Right. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and like make, Maybe, make do you think they'll go further down that path? Or? Well, I mean, and I think that's something that would probably change. You know, I don't think they're signing alt-right books because they devoutly believe in the messages of those books. I think they're signing those books because it's something else that none of the other big companies are doing. And weirdly, when Hachette did it, the like explosion and fanfare was so much that you haven't heard of them doing it since you know but there's those little peeps every so often where simon and schuster does it again and again and i've always you know that tells me that you know they're not scared away but not completely sold on the strategy either you know so i you know i think no matter what the biggest thing here is that for an independent you have more room to be an independent you have more room to innovate you have more room to publish books that these companies wouldn't whether or not they're the same company you know there's just like much more opportunity in the mid list than there is you know like i was teaching at psu and i told them the parable where i was like you'll never get to publish the obama autobiography so publish the book that sells well alongside the obama autobiography and you know that's something that's doable right like book pairings you can yeah you can achieve that much more so than you know like you don't want to like the my first little obama book yeah. pictures and so oh, that's a good idea and mm. so many that one's free go my, for it my first obama <laughs> like marrying into the family or <laughs> but the you know m and you know honestly if you look at it so many of those books don't earn out when they're paying these like million dollar advances anyway because it just doesn't it's such a gamble by the time the auctions have been bid up and you know there's no guarantees for a big book like that you know and so It'll be mostly interesting to see how, you know, this, you know, the, I guess, let me put it, rephrase that. The biggest shakeup of this will be that it will probably slow the next consolidation because there's been quite a bit in the past five years 
and really eight years if you want to take it that far back. Yeah, I guess if this is going to be a trend amongst the Justice Department, maybe it even points to them doing some deconsolidating of a companies like Amazon. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk of that lately too. So it does seem like that's kind of the new order. And Seems we'll like a positive direction. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's just, it's better for the industry at large. You know, the big shakeup that I felt at Winter Institute was that so many of the cool independent bookstores just felt like they had to stock big five books and they had to focus on those first and foremost. And that, you know, that's weird to me because I feel like the whole point of being an independent is not doing that. But, you know, you just have less control, I guess, when you're of a certain size. Thanks for joining us once again. Please send your questions to podcast at microcosmpublishing.com so we can answer them on future episodes. And please give us five stars on iTunes and everywhere else that podcasts are reviewed. You can find us on the internet at microcosm.pub. On Twitter at microcosm. On Facebook at microcosm publishing. On Instagram at microcosm underscore pub. And here in Portland, Oregon on North Williams Avenue. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.